What's up? In this video, I'm going to show you how to put together a room database using Kotlin coroutines. Here's a quick overview of what we'll be doing in this tutorial. First, we will build a room entity, which is kind of like a bridge between SQL and Kotlin or Java. Then we will build a data access object interface, which is how we will actually get the data in and out of our room database. Then we will look at our room database class and a bit of information on threading and concurrency. And finally, we will see how to perform CRUD operations on the database using coroutines. CRUD operations stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete. Just a quick reminder that, as usual, the source code for this example will be in the description box. So, let's get started. Entities in Room are essentially a bridge between a Java, or in this case Kotlin, data model, and the schema of an SQL database. In simpler terms, an SQL database is basically a spreadsheet, and each property of our entity will represent a cell in that spreadsheet. So to set up an entity in Room, what you want to do is you'll want to start with a basic data model like I have here. So what we'll need to do to set up this data model for Room is we'll need to add a bunch of annotations to it. Above the class declaration, you will want to add the entity annotation. This annotation accepts quite a few different arguments depending on what kind of configurations you want, or you can leave it blank for defaults. This annotation accepts quite a few different arguments depending on what configurations you want, or you can leave it blank and it will just use the defaults. Table name and indices shown in blue here are what are known as Kotlin default arguments. Table name basically states that I want the name of the database table to quite specifically be notes. If you were to leave that blank, then Room would simply use the name of your entity class by default. As for indices here, I'm basically saying that I want this particular value, creation date, to be indexed, and we'll actually see where that comes from in a moment. But what the indexing does is it basically just makes it more efficient to look up these particular Room Note objects by this particular value, creation date. Every Room entity needs to have at least one primary key. You can also create a primary key out of multiple different properties using a composite primary key, but we won't worry about that here. What this annotation does is it basically tells Room that this is the actual value which we want to use to distinguish between the different objects in our database. In essence, we are saying that this is the unique identifier for each Room note object. Now, in case you're wondering, creation date is actually created in the front end of the application, and it's essentially just the system time at which the note object was created at, and then translated into a legible date format. Another optional annotation is the column info annotation. Basically, what it allows me to do is specify a different name for each column in the database. And this is really just convention. SQL doesn't typically use camel case like in Java or Kotlin, but you don't really need to do this if you don't want to. One final note here, if you've read the documentation, then you're probably aware that Room can auto-generate and auto-increment primary keys. We don't do that in this particular tutorial, but I just wanted to mention that that is a possibility. It does have some consequences, though, when it comes to updating rows in the database, which I'll talk about later. Next, we have our data access object, or DAO. Now, essentially what this is, is it's just an interface with a bunch more annotations, which we'll look at in a moment. This DAO object will allow us to give our room database a bunch of functions which we can call on it to manipulate our data. Basically, what it'll do once we set up all of the annotations is it'll handle most of the work of writing really ugly SQL queries, if that's not something you're interested in. Now, there's an important point here. Many people use live data with room, and that is acceptable. Since I'm a big fan of clean architecture, I don't actually like to be passing live data objects through my domain layer. So instead of using live data objects for concurrency, we are going to be using coroutines. Thankfully, in recent versions of Room, it basically works out of the box. All we need to do is just add the suspend coroutine keyword, and this will actually make it super easy for us to get the data in and out of the Room database without blocking the main thread. Anyways, the first annotation that we'll need is at the top of the interface declaration, just at DAO. For our first function, we will use the query annotation. So basically how this works is the particular things we put within this query annotation will be translated into proper SQL. This basically just makes it so that it's easier for us to read and write the particular queries. This first statement here, select, is pretty self-explanatory, but when it's followed by this asterisk, it basically means select all. From is also quite self-explanatory, and just remember, notes is what I called the actual database. So basically what we're saying here is get everything from the note database. 
Now, when we want to get a note by ID, basically what we're saying here is select any note from the note database where the creation date, which is a particular column in the database, matches this creation date string, which we pass into this function. So notice how in this particular case, we have this colon followed by the name of the argument that we give to the function. This is how we actually pass that string data into the SQL statement. Delete is much simpler. All we do is we just add in this delete annotation. We pass in the room note object and room will sort out the rest of the details. For insert or update, I'm doing something a little bit more complicated. Now, remember how I said earlier that Room is capable of auto-generating IDs dynamically for you? Since we are not doing that, that's actually going to allow us to use this kind of upsert functionality here. So how this basically works is we pass in a Room note object into the Room database, and Room will search to see if there's any note which exists in the database that matches the one we passed in here. If it does happen to find one where the creation date matches, then we are telling it explicitly using the onConflict default argument to replace that particular note object. So effectively what we have here is both an update and a create new entry in the database at the same time. Now this works because creation date does not change whenever we update the particular note object. Again, if you're using dynamically generated IDs, you have to be a little bit more careful about that. Before we move on to writing the database, it's worth mentioning that Room will generate an implementation of our DAO class in the build folder of your Android project. You don't need to look at it, but for those of you who are curious about how Room works under the hood, it might be interesting. In particular, notice how it does have a reference to a Room database object, and also it does override the functions in our interface, such as insert or update note, delete note, and so forth. In the case of get notes, as you can see here, it does a lot of tedious work for us, so that is kind of the magic of Room. Next, we come to the Room database class. Now, this class is basically just a bunch of boilerplate, and I would not advise you to write this out by hand. Just copy and paste it and change what you need. In my case, I copied and pasted this originally from Android Sunflower, which is from the Google Samples repositories. Anyways, there's only a few things to mention here. Notice how we are referencing our Room note class. Also, if for some reason we change the structure of our database schema, we will want to increment the version by one or something like that. And also notice that we have a function which returns our note DAO object. As we'll see in a moment, we actually create the room note database object and then we request this room note DAO from it. And that's how we'll actually make calls to the database. As for this companion object, it's basically just a really powerful singleton initializer and it ensures that we never have more than one instance of our database in memory. For those curious, the volatile annotation ensures that no matter what thread tries to access the instance, it will always get a current instance, not something that's cached and therefore out of date. Also, this synchronized block here is kind of interesting. So this is a lock, which is a concept you'll be familiar with if you've studied operating systems. Basically what this means is that whenever a thread of the application enters this particular code block, it essentially locks it off so that no other threads can access it at the same time. It will go about doing its business, building the database or retrieving it if necessary. And this essentially doubly ensures that this thing does not get created more than once. Now, if you're just here to use a room database, this kind of concurrency stuff is not really that important to you. So if it didn't make sense, don't worry about it. I just thought it was worth mentioning. One final point here, just like our DAO, you can actually look up the implementation of your abstract database class in the build folder if you want to see how it works. The code is really ugly, but I always encourage people to actually look at the source code of these things to better learn how they work. So before I show you how we manipulate the Room database, I just want to show you how I actually create it. Each feature of this class has its very own injector, which is a very simple dependency injection container written by hand. So how we actually do things here is we will create an instance of our Room database, which requires context, but we don't actually want to pass a reference to the database itself. Rather, we will call dot room note DAO to get an instance to the data access object. In this app, I use a repository which handles both online and offline calls to different data sources. Essentially how this works is we just check to see if there is an active user. If there is an active user, then we will of course perform our operations on a remote Firestore database. If no user exists, then we just write to our local room note database. So this reference local refers to our DAO. So working with the DAO is super easy. Again, we're using coroutines, so note that these are suspend functions. Anyways, all we do is we just call whatever function we want on the DAO. So get local notes, we call local.getNotes. And it's a similar situation for the other functions we have here. 
Now, you may be wondering why I'm returning unit here in these result wrappers. Just note that for the case of deletes and insert or updates, I don't actually care about returning a particular value. So to satisfy the signature of these result wrappers, I just return unit. Also note that in my result wrapper, if an exception is thrown, it will be gobbled up by the result wrapper. So that's basically how I handle errors at the same time. The only other thing we need to look at here, which I've added as kind of a custom addition, is I have a bunch of extension functions and properties to map to and from note objects and room note objects. Let's have a quick look at those. So in this project, I have a big file called data extensions.kt, and I put in a whole bunch of different extension functions and extension properties. So this is pretty typical mapping stuff. The reason why I do this is I don't want all of the different room dependencies to be passing through my domain layer. So basically before I write to the database or retrieve data from the database, I just make sure that I'm mapping to and from some kind of plain note object. As you can see, this is why I choose not to use live data. I wanna try and keep things as clean as possible. If you found this tutorial helpful, please do me a favor and hit the like button down below. Follow us on your preferred social media networks and keep checking out the channel for more great content. Thank you for watching.